Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Take your seats again, and we'll start. Hey, Mary, how are you? I have one announcement to make that I forgot to make earlier. Up front on those tables where you checked in are some little pieces of paper and blank note cards. And this is from an organization called, well, um, what are they called? Project White Butterfly. And what they are is a place where they invite family and friends with loved ones struggling with addiction for a night of discussion and a Narcan training. This is their next thing. <laughs> um, they'll have a Narcan training by Project Dawn on Monday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Um, at the Garfield Heights Fire Department. So these are out front letting you know. They also leave blank note cards there for you to write notes. Um, please feel free to do that if you have a loved one suffering with addiction or have had a loved one who has passed. Please feel free to give your support and talk about a little bit about maybe your loved one or your feelings or things that you've dealt with, um, whatever you want to put on those cards. Thank you. Now we're going to go on <laughs> with our next panel. And this panel is dealing with all the medical issues that we have to deal with. We've heard a lot about them um, in the other panel um, earlier, but these are the medical people that are dealing with it every day. We have, um, as I said, I'm not giving full bios, but on the end here, we have Dr. Jennifer Baylett. I've known Dr. Baylett, I just have to say, for a long time since I started doing this. I think she was on the first panel that I ever gave. Um, the way that I got connected is she's with Metro Hospital and she runs a program, I think you still run that program, called the Moms Program. She gets moms who become pregnant and are still addicted safely through pregnancy and then works with the OBGYNs to deliver the baby. And if you've never seen a baby detox, I highly recommend becoming a baby comforter um, at at Metro because that's what I do every other Saturday is I go and I sit in a rocking chair for two hours and hold these little babies. And to hold a little baby that is detoxing, which you really don't know because they're not allowed to tell you that, but you know because many times when they're detoxing and they're trying to avoid giving them other medications to see if they can detox without medication, there's a baby in your arms when you first take them. They're hysterical crying. They calm down almost instantly from your touch. So they're really starved for attention. And your touch and holding them really keeps them much calmer. But at the same time, you can feel them trembling and shaking because they are in, this, in the situation where they've had a detox from their mother. So to me, this is the strongest sign about how strong addiction is and how much it does hit the brain. Because I know as a mother, when you give birth to a child, there's no stronger love. And I would have put myself in front of any bullet, bomb, whatever, to protect my child. And here these women are not strong enough to do that. And it has nothing to do with strength. It has to do that there is a brain disease that is affecting them. And um, Dr. Baylett is a saint, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> for doing what she does. Um, the next person is Andy Getz, who I have also known for many, many years. My daughter was her very first babysitter. Um, and so her husband is a rabbi and actually did the eulogy for my daughter's funeral. Um, the next person, I don't know if he needs any introduction, if you've ever been to any conference on opioids, chances are Ted Perrin was at the, has, has, was at the table somewhere. Um, he's very well known for all of his talks and all the work he is doing um, all over the community. <laughs> and we really appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Jessica McCullough, I just met you recently, and I, I don't know a whole lot about your background, but it is in the bio in here. And I want to thank you very much for being here. Um, you were very anxious to join the panel, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. And the same with Dr. Margolin. Um, again, I just met him. A friend of mine who knows about what I do connected us, and um, I appreciate your response and your help to be here today. So thank you all. and. I don't know, you all decided, I think, which order you're going in, so whatever, just go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, remember, 10 minutes. <laughs> uh. 
Thank you for that very warm introduction, Cheryl. Uh, my name is Jennifer Baylett. I'm a high-risk obstetrician at Metro Hospital. Um, and I wear lots of other hats. So some of you may know me in other capacities, but for the sake of today, I run the Mother and Child Dependency Program at Metro Health. Um, let me just give you a 30-second primer on pregnancy and opiate use disorder. Um, Pregnancy is a little bit different. They have an increased risk of preterm birth, increased risk of a small baby. That's uh, even more so if they smoke in addition to opiates, which is everybody. Um, and the issues are not just the drugs themselves. It's the needles and how they take the drugs. So snorting is safer than shooting. The shooting um, puts people at risk for infections, and that has grave potential um, problems for the baby. Uh, and the other thing is, as you can well imagine, sleeping with uh, lots of different men on a nightly basis without uh, protection is not good for pregnancy. I think that goes without saying. So the prostitution aspects um, of uh, opiate use disorder can be uh, hard. People don't necessarily always call themselves prostitutes. That's not a word that resonates with people. But trading sex for drugs, uh, paying your dealer in sexual favors is very common. Um, and so we work on a model of harm reduction, um, and we talk about all these things in great um, detail and frankness with our patients. Um, and then as Cheryl alluded to, babies go through withdrawal or, or potentially go through withdrawal after delivery. But what people don't understand is every time mom is shooting, getting high, and getting low again, and then getting high, the baby's going through those same cycles in utero which is less than ideal. And so the standard of care in pregnancy is to put moms on MAT, either Subutex, Suboxone, or Methadone during pregnancy to try to keep mom at more of a steady state. We heard a little bit um, from the first speaker, um, and I'm forgetting the doctor's name now, Nicole. Labor, thank you, um, about needing to keep that steady state with the MAT. That's a particularly important in pregnancy. And we do not, quote unquote, allow, not that we permit or allow any Patients do their own thing, but we do not recommend um, women go cold turkey or uh, completely detox during pregnancy. It's not considered safe for the for the infant. So at Metro Health, we have a program where, um, I, and I heard this on somebody's wish list, we have instant um, access for anybody who seeks help. So if you come into Metro Health pregnant and withdrawing from opiates, we will admit you. We will get you started on either methadone or subutex, depending on your particular situation. Although these days we're really recommending subutex more. If anybody wants to know why, I can go into that. Um, and we get you started uh, on the medication. My social work team comes in the next day, and I see many of our, our partners around town. We have partners around town with drug treatment centers. Um, who help uh, get our patients hooked up. We also have somebody in my clinic who will do Subutex. Um, and we also have the neonatologist in my clinic who will come. We also have access to the hepatitis C. Roughly 80% of my moms, 60 to 80% of my moms are hep have hepatitis C, and so we will get them hooked up. Um, as you well know, that's a treatable disease these days, but not during pregnancy. Um, so just a couple of things that I think are hopeful in this community. When I first started doing this around 2010, and even a little bit before, we were hard pressed to find a drug treatment center in Cleveland who would take a pregnant woman. Now pretty much they all do. Um, we have built that by going door to door. Sometimes I feel like the Avon lady knocking on people's doors, uh, Tupperware, whatever it is, um, and just giving people the reassurance that we at Metro are there for them. If they have questions, there is literally somebody on a phone 24-7 if you are unsure of what to do with the patient. Um, and that has helped a lot of the drug treatment centers in town feel comfortable um, taking on the patients. Um, somebody was... Um, sort of joking that the drug dealers are never in your best interest. There is a drug dealer in town. I don't know who this person is. God, God bless. When his customers come to him pregnant, he refuses to sell and sends them to me. Um, I, um, I'm not sure my mother would have been proud of this, but I am convinced that my name is scratched on the best bathroom wall stalls around town. <laughs> so um, people, I don't know somehow how they find me or where they find me, but they come. And we, get, we take referrals from anybody, any time of day, any point in pregnancy. Um, and that's been helpful. So I do think that the community, at least around pregnant um, women with opiate use disorder, the quilt in Cleveland that we get to wrap around people is pretty strong. Um, and people, we get people into treatment, drug treatment, usually within 48 hours. Some programs are stretched that a little more, some are a little better, but usually within 48 hours we can get people into uh, treatment, knock on wood. Um, 
So going forward, what do we um, need more of? Uh, we need more housing options along the spectrum. We can usually get people into the acute um, in, inpatient treatments relatively easily, but the transition out of those programs is still a little rough. Um, so we need more housing options. And I will say Metro is working on that. Stay tuned. No announcements today, but we are working on some things. Um, and what I would like to see going forward is and somebody else referred to this as sort of the preventive piece. I, we've got all these kids who are born to moms with opiate use disorder. We know that just by having a mom, regardless of what medicines or what happens, they're at risk because they have high-risk families. Let's get ahead of the game with these kids. Um, some of them are in foster care. Some of them are in custodial care of their parents or their grandmothers or other family members. Um, Let's start teaching them the life coping skills early. Let's get ahead of the game. And I don't know what that looks like. I haven't thought about that a ton. I'm not an early childhood expert. Um, but we have a group of folks we know are at risk sometime in the next 10 years. They're little kids now. Let's start working on those coping skills now and get ahead of the score. So thank you. OK, so um, I've learned a lot today. But probably the most important thing I've learned is uh, something about myself, uh, that I'm a rule keeper. And Cheryl gave us three questions to guide us in what we would present, and I have stuck to them. So I am going to literally answer the questions um, that Cheryl guided us with today. Um, and I would have started with a very personal story, but Cheryl shared that already, that my um, most intense exposure to this was the day I got a text from a friend that Melissa Koppel had died suddenly. Um, and of course, we had a close relationship with Melissa. I trusted her with my children. She was a beautiful, loving, compassionate kid. Um, and we were all devastated and shocked. And the reason I start with that story is because I was the clinician in my training that said, addiction's not for me. You know, there's a lot of other things I'm more skilled at. I don't feel like that's where I belong. And I successfully avoided that area of work for a very long time. And what I've learned in the last five years um, is that you can't. You cannot be a clinician in this community right now and avoid addiction. And so the biggest change, and this is the, on a personal level for me, is that I am trying to educate myself all of the time. I'm so grateful for what Cheryl is doing. And I really feel that it is irresponsible for any of us who are working in any kind of mental health field to sort of say this is an area we don't cover because the waves of expansion of the number of people that are impacted by this are so vast. Um, the second thing that I'd like to say is that uh, the, the biggest change, so what I'd say that I've worked on in the last five years is educating myself and making sure that I pass that information on as soon as I have it. I've already learned new things today that I intend to pass on to clients tomorrow. Um, but the other thing that's changed, um, I actually came across my first heroin overdose working in hospice. And it was about two or three years before Melissa died. And at that point, it was completely shocking to the degree the family never shared with anybody how their young daughter died. There were no resources for this mother. There was incredible shame. The police force were having terrible struggle getting the dealer and trying to figure out how to charge him. It was nothing like what we see today. Um, so what I want to really say is the greatest change is voices like Cheryl's. Um, this is hard to do what she's doing. And it's hard because she can't save her own child. And I know she isn't the only voice. But it takes a lot when you're trying to survive every day after losing a child to go out and put energy to save somebody else's child. And I, I, I know people know it's sitting here, but um, it's bigger than you think. And more people are doing that. And what altruism. The most pressing issue that I'm experiencing right now in the area of addiction that I would like to see changed um, is something that's been spoken a lot about today, and that's stigma. And I want to speak about it particularly from the perspective of being a therapist. And um, I don't work with clients who are in active addiction. And thank goodness all of you, many of you here are doing that. But I work with family members or friends who are struggling with a loved one in addiction. And unfortunately, I hate to be the voice um, of the grief counselor, but I am the person that is there when everything went wrong. We are preaching to the choir in here, which is wonderful and not enough. Um, so yes, there's change. Yes, stigma is reduced. 
And yes, stigma is alive, very much alive out there. And I wanted to talk a little bit about a book um, that Stephanie Whittles Wax uh, wrote called Everything is Horrible and Wonderful. I'm not sure if people are aware of Harris Whittles, who is a, a com famous comedian. Um, he was on Parks and Rec. Um, and he died of a heroin overdose. And she's written this book about her journey, her and her mom. And she says things in the book which are absolutely true. And I see and hear from parents and friends who have survived, um, who, have, who have lost someone to a heroin overdose that their loved one's death is uh, not perceived as an honorable way to die. We've used this example of cancer a lot today, but this, th these are literally things people hear, that when you have lost a child to breast cancer, nobody says, um, nobody questions where, where their parents went wrong. Uh, we don't blame a cancer patient for dying or making shameful choices. When someone who's dealing with another disease like uh, heart you know heart condition or diabetes and sort of goes off their diet or gains weight or isn't exercising um, we don't really look at their relapse as a weakness of character um, there's a lot of voices in the background after there's a loss particularly which i'm talking about unfortunately because it's my area of expertise um, where there's quiet judgment about it, it wouldn't have happened to us or the family how could they have missed it or why didn't they do more um, and then I know we've talked about the criminal system, which obviously there's a lot of change and reform in. Uh, but in other medical struggles, when people don't follow a self-care plan, um, kind of you know fall off taking care of themselves, they don't end up in the criminal system, even though I understand that can be a really helpful resource at this point. To quote one mom who lost a loved one to an overdose, the silence is deafening. And we talked, I think, in our very first presentation, uh, the first presentation Cheryl created several years ago, that this is not a casserole death. So people are there in the beginning, and then through lack of understanding, through stigma of mental health and addiction in particular, people stop showing up. People stop asking questions. People stop wanting to hear about your child. There's a lot of quiet judgment that is going on. So from my point of view, um, we need to be providing more compassion and support within the family system in order to help families or chosen families or loved ones to in turn support those who are struggling with addiction. We need to be there after grief because what happens to the families or friends of someone who um, lost a loved one to an overdose is really complex. They are obviously grieving and suffering they are feeling guilt. They're feeling a sense of failure. They're also feeling a sense of relief, which is very difficult for some people to understand. And they have a resounding lack of support. So what I want us to understand and to kind of think about the community at large is, is my time almost up? Is that why you're standing? OK. Um, is that none of us is immune. And I know we've heard that today. We know this is, I know there's tendencies. And it sounds like the tendencies are flipping again. But addiction crosses across culture, age, race, religion. This is happening everywhere, and none of us is immune. So I think um, our response should be, in every capacity here, that we need to learn to show up, and that our question should always be, how can we help? And the third piece that I wanted to talk about is one that I'm probably most passionate about and have released uh, clear information about. I can't give you a plan that I could design and say, let's do this. And I'm fully aware that this is a pipe dream. And I'm fully aware that this involves financial resources and HIPAA laws and all kinds of really, really complex things. But I can tell you that when I meet with surviving friends and families, the most challenging emotional experience for them is the sense of helplessness the helplessness that they experience during the addiction, the fear they experience during relapse, um, the hopelessness in terms of support at the end um, if there has been a death. And I, I often, I worked in hospice for a long time, and here's where my pipe dream fantasy comes up. The hospice model, whether people use it that way or not, is to treat the entire family system. And some families say, just focus on the patient. And other families say, bring in everybody. We all need support, we need education, we need help, we need check-ins every week. 
you know, this is a systemic problem, and we know this about addiction. It is impacting the entire family system. And we're very patient-centered in this. And I understand we have treatment in, you know, when people go into treatment and there's family sessions and there's support groups. I don't think any of it is enough. And I think that we need, whether it is biological family or chosen family, you know, if the family, biological family is not helpful, how do we extend the support so that it gives the, those struggling with an addiction greater capacity to get to the place that they need to get to. Um, in social work school, I'm almost done. I feel, because I'm a rule keeper. I want to do 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So in social work school, we always studied, you know, how the family system is, uh, I'm from South Africa, so I always say this wrong, mobile, mobile, mm -hmm. the thing that hangs, we say mm -hmm. mobile, hangs over the baby crib, mobile, thank you. <laughs> you know, so the family system is, everything is connected and things are sort of turning in different directions, but we can't just focus on one part of the family because the whole family system is impacted. Um, so that's really my speech, that um, we need to figure out a way to coordinate care. Like if families are feeling helpless and we have HIPAA laws that, you know, we can't cross communicate, who's holding the family up and supporting the family? I have a client every single week and I'm not an addiction counselor negotiating this. And you know, what does the family member do when they know their, their family member is going to their counselor and saying, you know, I'm good, but they know the client is, their, their loved one is using. We, we, there's a breakdown in terms of how we connect all of these resources and expand supports from my perspective. Um, so I have this fantasy that we will coordinate care beyond the way that we have done right now. And I know we've made incredible strides in many, many systems too, uh, particularly in coordination of medical care and the court systems. Physicians are really talking to each other. They're, they're setting the model and can we move that out? Um, lastly, um, I know you all know who we are. I don't really know who's sitting in the audience. And so I just want to generally say, um, that for those of you who are grieving or fear that you will be grieving, um, I want you to, to share the story of your loved one as their whole person. You know, they are not completely defined by their addiction. Um, they are people who loved and who, who loved others and who are loved and who touched hearts and continue to touch your heart. Um, and how, how they died, if they did die, is not their whole story. Um, to me, Melissa Koppel would always be this fun kid who would do anything to play with the little guys. Um, she would take care of anybody who was in her world that she cared about, and even some of those that were outside of that. She absolutely loved everybody around her, and I refuse to define her memory purely as an addict. Thank you. Oh gosh. Well, um, I mean, ev every day uh, dealing with um, with people with substance use disorders, and currently during this this opioid epidemic and crisis, is just it's a new challenge, but also a new opportunity. It really is. I've I've been been working with people with opiate addiction now for 34 years. Uh, probably treated a hundred thousand or more people, or supervised their treatment. Um, and, um, and I'm often thankful that I was a history major in college before I went to, went to medical school, because uh, it helps me with perspective. Um, because if, if, if I hadn't been a history major in college, I, I may have lost perspective uh, many times along, along the way. Um, but part of having perspective also uh, is uh, really shameful. Uh, for our community and our society. Because we went through this in 1990 around cocaine. I mean, the world was coming to an end in 1990 because of crack babies, right? You know, lock up women who are pregnant. You can never get them off of cocaine, blah, 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 blah. Um, an incredible crisis, hyper-criminalization of people with possession of crack cocaine because they were going to end Western society with this scourge. And unfortunately, 
You know, every opiate epidemic in the history of the U.S. since the Civil War has been followed by an amphetamine epidemic or cocaine epidemic, and every cocaine epidemic has been followed by an opiate epidemic. So in the 1990s, early 90s, those of us who were history majors and also addiction doctors, I think there's three in all of America, um, said, oh, there's probably going to be an opiate crisis. But no one expected an opiate crisis like this, and that's the astonishing thing. This opiate crisis has been going on since 1995. Um, this has been a long opiate crisis. 1995, we started seeing the uptick of people being admitted with prescription opiate addiction. So this opiate crisis um, was predictable and predicted and still is an absolute unmitigated disaster for our society, for our community, for our families, um, for all of us. Um, this is the first addiction crisis in America to be primarily, to have its primary genesis in iatrogenesis, meaning caused by the medical profession. And that is horrific. There's never been an opiate crisis in the history of the US that spread beyond the East and the West Coast and maybe the entertainment business, uh, and then some sort of urban areas. This opiate crisis hit small towns and rural areas harder than urban areas. Harder than urban areas. There's never been an opiate crisis in small towns, rural areas, or even very much in suburbs in the past, um, except for this one because it was started with prescribing. Uh, that sort of primed the pump. Number two, the deaths. You know, when a person overdoses on alcohol, they pass out. And they wake up the next day shameful. And hopefully seeking treatment, but often not. When a person overdoses on cocaine, they get chest pain and paranoid and come to the emergency room. And can be dangerous in the emergency room when they're paranoid. But, eh, you know, it passes. When a person overdoses on opioids, they die unless you get them naloxone quickly. But the weird thing is the person with opiate addiction is trying, when they're actively addicted, they're trying to catch a nod, a sort of yellow, mellow, you know, Donovan called it mellow yellow in the 1960s. And the Beatles in the 70s were in a yellow submarine, primarily because of John Lennon's heroin addiction. It's sort of a mellow, yellow, sleepy nod. That's level one coma. Being asleep is level two coma, and being dead is level three coma. It is all a miscalculation that happens while you're asleep. And so that's why we've seen this horrendous death rate, partly because of the opiates and partly because of the fentanyl and then the carfentanyl and then the sufentanyl, the potency of the opiates that are involved. And it's astonishing. I think the other amazing thing about the opioid crisis is the sobriety rates. Of people who live, better than two-thirds get sober. So every day when I go to bed, I worry about who I'm going to hear about the next day who may have died, um, and whether there's a wake I need to go to, and I am so, so tired of hearing about patients who I care about who've died. Um, dear, wonderful people uh, who've died. But treatment works. And if people work together, the criminal justice system, the addiction treatment system, if we add medication-assisted treatment, if we get naloxone out to every family and every person uh, who has opiate addiction or is at risk of opiate addiction, um, if we can keep people alive, the majority gets sober uh, and do well. Uh, and that uh, is what makes it a sort of a joyful thing to wake up in the morning and, uh, and head off to work. So treatment works. So predictability, iatrogenic, um, the astonishing number of deaths, and the resiliency of sobriety um, are, are things that, that ring true to me throughout this epidemic, like the cocaine epidemic before it, and like our unending alcoholism epidemic since World War II. Um, 
most people eventually get sober if we can keep them alive. So what needs to change? Um, I think we need to change as a community, and I think this is the kind of venue that makes such a big difference. And and Cheryl and the the Siegel Center here, I I, I take my hat off um, to sort of trying to pull back um, the secrecy. Addiction thrives in secrecy. Uh, sobriety thrives in privacy, appropriate privacy, where everybody who needs to know does know and talks about it. I think the fax machine is the single best antidote to HIPAA. <laughs> I encourage every family of a person suffering from addiction to just call the treatment provider of that person and don't say, is my son or daughter being treated? Because the HIPAA police will be all over you like flies on dog manure. We can neither confirm nor deny that so-and-so is, has been, or ever will be a patient of ours, but thank you so much for calling and have a good day. Click. That's wrong. What they're supposed to say is we can neither confirm nor deny that so-and-so is or has been or ever will be a patient of ours. But hypothetically, if that person is, was, or ever will be a patient of ours, and if you have information that be, might be useful in their care, let me give you our fax number. And please write down everything you know and send it to us. So what I tell families is don't even ask. Just call up and say, hi, what's your fax number? There's no HIPAA around fax numbers. And then just fax all the data you have. The impending relapse, not going to meetings, falling away from the sponsor, starting to be prescribed addictive drugs by other well-meaning doctors who don't know their elbow from their backside when it comes to addiction to a person with addictive disease. Because the person with addiction swears the only thing that helps is their clonazepam and their Adderall. The pharmacologic equivalent of gin and methamphetamine, um, just spill the beans because sobriety thrives in appropriate privacy and addiction thrives in secrecy. So as a community, we have to pull back the shroud of secrecy and we have to start demanding uh, more communications. And we can do that electronically, we can do that with fax machines, we can do that in a lot of ways, but we have to do it. In order to, uh, one of the things we have to do as a society is to fight back when we see injustice. And we are currently in Cuyahoga County over the last 12 months, since the middle of December 2018, seeing an active, purposeful injustice on the part of managed Medicaid. Managed Medicaid since the middle of December 2018 has been relentlessly denying treatment for people with opioid addiction who are asking for care under the shroud, the fig leaf, that the level of care they're asking for is the not, not the appropriate level of care. Well, if the appropriate level of care is not available, the next highest level of care is the most appropriate level of care. And treatment on demand trumps waiting for the appropriate level of care when you know that if there's a three to six week waiting list for a 3.7 detox and an open bed in a 4.0 detox, if you send a person home to wait for 3.7 detox, there's a substantial chance they will die in the next three weeks while they wait for that 3.7 bed. Period. End of story. It's morally reprehensible. And we as a society just smile and say, oh, yes, that's an ASAM criteria. No, the ASAM criteria that is the strongest is treatment on demand when the house is burning down and people are dying all around us. So that's one specific concrete recommendation I have. A second specific concrete recommendation that I have is the unacceptable medical education about addictive disease unacceptable medical education about addictive disease. We did a study several years ago, back in the late 90s. We found that the second strongest predictor of a person with addiction documented in their medical record receiving an addictive drug as an outpatient, which is kind of like giving penicillin to a person who's allergic to penicillin, was that person um, the, the second strongest predictor of receiving an addictive drug was having addiction in your chart and having a resident as your, attending, as your doctor.
The strongest predictor was having addiction in your chart and having an attending as your doctor. The only people who gave addictive disease d drugs to people more often with addictive disease than the residents was their teaching attendings. And that's why we have the ongoing problems we have. The opiate crisis has much, much of its roots in iatrogenesis, meaning started by the medical profession. It is morally unacceptable to have a medical teaching hospital in America without an addiction consult service. But 80% of teaching hospitals in America don't have a single God-blessed addiction medicine or addiction psychiatrist on the medical staff <coughs> to provide guidance and assistance to the people who are learning in the next generation of doctors. That is, that is a failing of the medical profession that is unacceptable. It was unacceptable in the 1990s. It's been unacceptable forever. It's really unacceptable now. So when I think about silver linings, I think about things like today. I think about drug courts, which are a miracle, an absolute miracle. I think about medication-assisted treatment and, uh, and the distribution of naloxone into the community. And I think about the fact that today, 20% of teaching hospitals in America have an addiction consult service. And when I started the first addiction consult service I ever started in 1985 at Johns Hopkins and Baltimore City Hospital, 0% of teaching hospitals in America had an addiction consult service. So we've gone from 0 to 20, and we need to go from 20 to 100 like in a year. And on that happy note, I'll quit. <laughs> First of all, I would like to just say I'm honored to share this panel with such experience and wisdom. Um, I'm newer to addiction for the past five years. Uh, I also will be going through the three points <laughs> that Cheryl sends out and kind of addressing those <laughs> and have been instrumental in uh, the addiction um, and substance use uh, phenomena that's going on. and. So I'll start by just going through, some of you know uh, the CARA, um, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act uh, that allowed and expanded uh, prescribing privileges to uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So that included myself being a nurse practitioner. Um, that allowed me, to, while working at a, a federally qualified health center um, that received grant funding from the Adams Board to develop a, a primary care-based model uh, and substance abuse treatment program, um, which included a dis interdisciplinary team of a nurse, case manager, social worker, and MA. And I know that's not typical for a primary care clinic to have all of those services readily available um, at one time. So it was like an ideal situation where you had money available and you had a place where you can actually institute this uh, for patients who actually needed the service. So that's what I, I uh, actually began. Um, I would say another thing that uh, actually was instrumental was the uh, facility and their willingness to allow a nurse practitioner to lead the program um, when there wasn't a uh, physician or addiction medicine specialist who could run it in that facility. Um, so I felt honored to have that privilege to start the program and we were able to grow the program. It's still going today. Um, so that's one thing um, that I would say that I've worked on in the last five years. Um, another thing was uh, with the uh, HR6, which is the Support for Patients and Communities Act that was signed by President Trump, um, emphasized uh, that there needed to be more teaching, more standardization, and um, more addiction medicine um, present, as Dr. Perrin um, stated. So with that, I've been working with Ursuline uh, College uh, and the University of Pittsburgh uh, received a SAMHSA grant to help diver uh, further develop educational uh, materials, uh, <coughs> observation experiences so that nurse practitioners can understand and be able to treat substance use disorder and refer um, when needed and also to 
break away some of the stigma, um, as Dr. Perrin just said, within the medical uh, community, because I think that's a lot of place, times where it starts. We have a preconceived conception in our head about what a person who has an addiction um, may look like or may be, but that's not the case. Um, so um, I would say the most pressing issue that I would like to address, I can't say that it's feasible, but I would love to see it done, is uh, deregulation of buprenorphine. So everybody, if everyone knows, you have the waiver, you know, it, it limits who can prescribe, it limits how many you can prescribe to as far as, you know, patients who actually need to be treated. So why is there a limit on treatment and how to treat when there's not a limit really on people who need pain medications or opiates or some of the other medications that actually are causing or, or have caused the actual opi opiate epidemic. So that's one thing that I would like to see deregulated. Um, yes, it's still going to need some regulations and monitoring because it's a scheduled medication, but I think there's a misconception that buprenorphine is a drug that's just diverted to be used and abused, just like heroin or, or fentanyl or some other uh, substance, but it's usually not. I can tell you from talking with patients that they're using it to um, just not go through withdrawal symptoms after using heroin. They're actually trying to self-treat and uh, treat themselves to get off of heroin. Or, you know, they're actually using it because they can't purchase it or uh, buy it from the pharmacy because they don't have insurance or some other reasons. Um, I mean, and one thing, it is a combined with, you know, or naloxone or Narcan. So it's, it's not able to be abused intravenously. So... Um, I do have a article, and it's uh, buprenorphine deregulation and mainstream treatment for opiate use disorder, and it's called X the X waiver. So I have a few copies that I'll put out there on the on the table if anyone would like to read it. It's just a short two pager, good read, just on how deregulation of the X waiver could potentially allow more prescribers and more access to care. Um, do I see this missing um, or needs to be done? Um, I would say stigma. Uh, the, I know everyone's kind of talked about stigma and it's a big thing. But I thought this morning of this example and, you know, I have an 18 year old daughter. She came to me and she said, oh, my throat is, you know, really swollen, it really hurts, you know, she has a history of, you know, tonsillitis and things, and she, I said, oh, okay, that's, you know, it's, um, well, let's just wait a little bit, you know, we can probably take you to the clinic, get you checked out. Um, but I was thinking, like, hey, what if my daughter came to me and she said, mom, I have, you know, opiate use disorder. It, is it just as easy to say, hey, let's just go right up the street to, you know, Metro Clinic and like get in and somebody will see me and there won't be any bias, there won't be any, you know, stereotyping. It's going to be just as easy to get in and get treated for what could potentially be strep throat, can be easily treated as an opiate use disorder. That's what really hit me. It's like, no, it's not. And that's where we need to push on and press forward and where we need to be. Um, that would definitely open up more patients to coming in and not being afraid um, of actually receiving treatment from the medical community. Um, patients are definitely scared. They're ashamed. Um, I think that a lot of times they feel hurried or rushed when you go into an appointment times with primary care providers are very slim, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So even primary care providers themselves sometimes don't want to get involved in treatment just because of the time that it requires to actually see patients and manage their conditions because they're very complex, you know, as being spoke about as HIV, hepatitis, you know, a person who's unemployed, doesn't have housing, um, doesn't have insurance. These are a lot of things that needs to be addressed and it can't happen in 10 minutes. Yeah, it, it just won't. And so having support services is definitely uh, a big thing when you're treating this population. 
Um, I would also say being a uh, finishing my second year of PhD studies at Case Western, my goal is to research the gap in treatment from provider to actual treatment because there, there is a gap. Um, working with uh, Ursuline and trying to develop uh, their curriculum and make more waiver prescribers available, I can't say that that's the answer, but it helps. But we still have a lot of waiver physicians, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants who don't prescribe. And there's a number of reasons why um, that's been mentioned. So my goal is to try to identify some of these barriers and gaps to put out there so we can have some concrete data to say this is the reason why and this is hopefully some recommendations of how to fix them because we just can't have a bunch of people being wavered and then a bunch of people over here who has an opiate use disorder but there's a disconnect and we see that in the numbers. So that's, that's one of my goals. Um, and uh, one final thing, uh, another barrier that I saw was just uh, restriction, of, restriction of treatment facilities. Some just don't allow uh, patients who are on buprenorphine to live if they're sober housings or halfway houses or different facilities. So if a patient does go to one of the treatment programs, say for instance a pregnant mom comes out and she needs to go into some type of sober houses or sober livings, everyone is in accepting of a patient who is actually on buprenorphine. Um, and that's, that's actually a barrier because otherwise where are they going to go? They, they need somewhere to go. We need to have an open mind and about this is a disease process. The patient is actually being treated. Um, and, and again, not just an addict. Um, so that's where I see some other barriers. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Margolin. I understand I'm the last speaker, uh, the last speaker and I'll try to keep everybody awake. And I'll try to communicate my points clearly. And let me explain to you what, um, what is the purpose of this talk and why it might be important. Why I, I'm, I was trained in uh, pain medicine, in interventional pain medicine. We came to Ohio about 10 years ago. And we ended up in the epicenter of the epidemic. And why screening and brief intervention, these fancy words are important, because most people at least at the early stages of addiction, do not come to their primary doctors and say, hey, I'm a cocaine addict, could you find me a program? They say, well, you know, I have back pain, you know, maybe, you know, I moved something heavy, it hurts real bad, shoots down the leg, they go online. And um, they are sent to pain management. And here we are, I'm pain management, and I would say 80% of my consults have a question, is this person a good candidate for pain medication? So here we go. Here, so here is the perspective that we have and the challenges and how we deal with that. So I just show you this um, pain medicine news edition that says open opioid overdose now leads to more death than motor vehicle accidents. A lot been said. I'm not going to repeat it. It's pretty obvious, especially in Ohio. Why people die? It was also mentioned. This is uh, this is. Uh, um, research from National Institute of Drug and Addiction that shows that heroin and fentanyl are the leading causes of death. Now, what happened? Um, around 2011, around 2015, in Ohio, for example, there was a very reasonable attempt to regulate opioid prescription. But unfortunately, regulations don't change people. Regulations don't change people as reasonable as they are. So without uh, appropriate um, treatment system, these people go to the street, they get heroin, they get fentanyl, and fentanyl is on the rise. It's, it's being shipped from overseas. I don't think it gets enough media coverage. I have a patient whose son went to college, and, and uh, we, I'm, I'm going to end with the, with the culture of college parties. He went to college, but a good kid got to, he, she says, the first joint in his life and drop dead because fentanyl was mixed. Um, so we need to develop a system. How we screen these people? How, how we are, you know, no, I can't read people's mind. 
I did uh, go for a fellowship. I, I'm, I did, I tried to do, to go for a lot of CME. How, how we screen people? Who makes this decision? Now, the stakes are very high because if you give opioids to somebody who is untreated addict, it will cause overdose. If you push a legitimate patient with chronic pain in Ohio, there is a good chance he will go on the street and self-medicate him or herself. So how we, how we deal with that? One of the problems is that we deal with self-reported complaints, right? Um, there is strong fear of social consequences. A lot of patients did not tell me the truth because they believed that I'm going to report to social security, to their job, I will go to talk to their family, and it's not what we do, but that's the fear that prevented them from telling the truth. And some of them have psychological comorbidities. They have anxiety disorder, they can have PTSD, um, they have major depression, um, and other disorders, and that makes communication even more challenging. So first, and this patient has nothing to do with addiction, they allowed me to use their pictures, but it shows, it shows that the first rule that I will tell you, build a rapport, build a good relationship. And sometimes this um, patient in life, I, I'm not going to tell his medical history, but he went through, through a major hospital, and the problem is nobody talked to him. I think they took the dis decent care to him. Nobody took time. I don't blame him. I worked for hospital for four years, and the lady on the right, it was very difficult to establish this relationship. She's an amazing lady with a lot of medical problems until I noticed this doll, and I asked her, hey, what is, she's legally blind. I asked her, what is this doll? And she said, it's Star Trek. So we talked about Star Trek for 15 minutes, and then she opened up and she said, you know, I've been going through this pain for 20 years, and I can't see, but I believe there is this force outside me that keeps me going. And that we started talking, and I think it was a clinical success. Another thing, if a person has a service dog, you got to report with a service dog, you got to report with the owner. And so it, it really works. Now, I'm not going to repeat it, but these are the criteria of addiction from UCLA. And they, when I started, it seems like not rocket science to me. It's pretty straightforward. But the problem is how you obtain this information in a credible way from a patient. What can you do? One of the things we do is Questionaries. They're validated by studies. They're recommended by the medical board. There is risk certification. But here's the problem. There's something called SOAPARP, screening for patient and pain. What does this mean? Everything is zero. Person never got, never had mood swings, never got angry, never got bored in his life. It means he Googled it. He Googled it, and it's not, there's a PDF file, and he read it. So that makes it much more difficult. Well, you can tell me, well, let's go to the urine screen. It's objective data. Um, you can do point of care or you can do confirmation urine screen. But here is the problem with urine screen. You need to read and interpret them. And sometimes it can be challenging. Like this is a classic triad we see in Ohio. Unprescribed fentanyl, unprescribed oxycodone, and ATOH. This person is a is, is high risk patient that needs immediate attention. Um, obviously, this is alcohol use, right? It's a very high alcohol level. And this is all pretty straightforward. But many times we get this. What is this low ethyl sulfate level? We have a, a pharmacology doctor we can sign. But it's a question, is it non-alcoholic drink? Is it remote drinking? There is no one way to read this urine screen. You need to match it to clinical history. And that takes a lot of time, which, as Tad mentioned, we also have this problem many times does, is not reimbursed by insurance. They don't believe you need it. You need it, don't need to take time to screen patients for drug or alcohol or denied. Tests are denied. Urine screens are limited in number you can do, it, and so on. Um, this is another thing. It's a high level of oxycodone without metabolites. So it's most probably person was adding oxycodone in the urine, just going to the restroom and dropping oxycodone in the urine. Um, this one looks clean, except you see in the bottom it says common dilute. You know, just added water to the urine screen, and so on. We, we, we see that a lot, and that's the saliva testing from the same patient, which shows several substances. Again, opioid, hydrocodone, benzo, lorazepam, and marijuana. Again, it's, it's, very, it's pretty common, unfortunately, in this area. The point that I'm trying to make, it takes a lot to do and to interpret urine screen correctly. And one urine screen, primarily in primary 
care office does not necessarily solve the problem. Now, we also deal with difficult patients. People are not happy when you show them urine screens that I showed to you, and uh, some of them, you know, you know, see this cocaine or marijuana, or whatever they see, it's hard to argue with them. And we, some of them act out. Some of them act out. Um, even sending me these messages and calling me many times. It doesn't, it's not every other patient, but it does happen. And sorry for, yeah, that's, uh, that's the same person. And uh, um, uh, we have a hard time dealing with that. And we even feel that, as you heard my comments, that, you know, legal system is not out so much to help us out. I mean, they follow the protocol. Police shows up and says, we're so sorry. If the patient is here, we definitely would transpass them. But that's, that's the most they do. So we decided to create some kind of screening system. That's the improvement we had over the last five years that could reliably help us to do that. That's the, I, that's the point that I'm trying to communicate, and that's our experience. So we use several assessments at the same time. We use very thorough history and physical, and I did, I liked my internship in internal medicine. It really helped me. It was a good basis of doing history and physical a good level. Uh, understanding medical condition, using several assessments, using functional assessment, using setting goals. That's this flow chart rule 4731 in Ohio. You need to set goals and follow up. And then confirming that with point of care and confirmation urine drug screen and ORSA report, right, where you can't, I have my two nurse practitioners here so they can confirm we are crazy on ORS. You can't go wrong with obtaining extra ORS. Um, it only can help. Um, um, we still run, as I mentioned, if third party peers, they don't want to, they don't believe patient people should be screened or screened this often, even they're high risk patients that conferred by NARC score. Imaging not approved, even though it's required by regulatory agencies, they don't care, they don't want to pay for MRI. Even for x rays, we sometimes have problems. Um, and um, it's a good idea, it's sometimes challenging to put it together. Uh, we created videos. Now, reading levels differ in different areas. We discovered, so as much as we try to write a good agreement or a good educational uh, sheet to the pa and give it to the patient, um, they like to listen and watch. So we have a video, about 30 minute video, about uh, um, risks and benefits um, and the agreement. And then they allowed to ask questions. We started the YouTube channel. Yeah, you can check us on YouTube. And we try, I try to do it short and funny as much as I can. And we started for our patients, because everybody has cell phone, and some of them are watching in, in the waiting area. No commercials in that, I can promise. So it's on done for patients. And actually, now we see that most people who watch it are not our patients. And we do it for free. We're glad to, to contribute to the community this way. We also ran a small study on correlation between narcosco and food addiction. Uh, and we found a correlation, we presented it in family med medicine at some point, and it, it's a very short time, but we actually good experience with lifestyle modifications, with exercise, diet changes, mindfulness, it does work. It does not cure addiction in my experience, and we have a small suboxone program. It does improve the recovery rate, it does make it much easier to communicate with the patient, it does work. Uh, it's challenging to do it in a small private practice, but uh, we, we definitely tried. Now, this is a catch-22 we discussed uh, about compliance and insurance. Um, we, even though the official guidelines for all insurances say that uh, non-physicians should not tell physicians how to practice medicine, but if HMO tells you you're allowed four urine screens a, a year, or this is denied, or this would be seen as overpayment, this is, we don't think it's medically necessary, and you deal with population that does not have means and it's not ethical to charge them, obviously they do tell you how to practice medicine, and that's, let's be honest about it. Um, we also did a study on the use of electrodiagnostic studies. Dr. Kimura, if you're familiar, he's the author of the textbook. He was, he agreed to guide us, and we find a good, found a good uh, um, impact uh, additional testing and uh, um, additional specialists involved generally do improve outcomes. 
Uh, I mentioned the strategy to combat opioid use, abuse, misuse, and overdose. We were very happy. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2017 had a, like a larger scale of uh, a larger scale meeting, I guess, similar to that, and they came up with uh, those five points. And one of them advanced the practice of pain management to enable access to high-quality, evidence-based pain care that reduces the burden for pain for individuals, which sounds great. Since then. I w I'm not aware of any change, at least on our level. If you do, please let me know. I don't, but it's a great idea, and I hope it will be implemented. And uh, again, from our point, we practice in an overregulated environment. Ohio is seen by pain management that one of the three most difficult uh, uh, challenging states to practice pain medicine. And I think switching from fear to cooperation and this wisdom of those who, who say I can and those who, uh, who say I cannot do are both right. And that's true. I think we can change it. I think, it, I think we can if we stick together and make an effort. And there was an, a common, excellent comment about, um, that you made about our society. I see the teens with, obviously, the picture above is Marilyn Monroe, right? I see those pictures on T-shirts. And uh, she died from overdose at the age of 36. And it's like she's an icon. And some of them tell me, look, that's what stars do. That's in culture. That's what, that's what stars do. Do you know, guys, who is in the bottom? Anybody? No? Um, I like this person. His name is Normal Bollock. Check. He was a humble scientist. He, in he, in he invented different strains of wheat that saves close to 1 billion people from starvation. I would say they estimate close to 100 million people in India were saved from starvation. Otherwise, he was a very boring person, was not involved in any scandals, was married to the same woman for 50 years. And I don't see him on T-shirts. You know, <laughs> When we start seeing him on T-shirts, we know that the culture has changed. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Couple questions. I'm coming. I'm coming. Up front first. <laughs> Thank you all. It was great. I just want to make a uh, comment. Uh, Dr. Perrin told us that <clears throat> we must remember history and that addiction thrives in blindness. And um, forgetting about the past. So I want to say that this addiction problem with opiates started a long time ago, as he mentioned, and was prim primarily in the African-American community and the inner city community, and nobody really cared about it. Nobody cared about it. It wasn't considered a brain disease. Nobody thought about decreasing stigma. And then when it became apparent in the Caucasian community, and we know that the African-American patient was less likely to receive pain medication prescribed to them, we didn't become part of this. The Caucasian community became part of it. And then there were all kinds of studies to look at brain involvement and to decrease stigma and to make this a more comprehensive way to treat patients, which I'm all in for, uh, look forward to. However, we cannot forget the origins of this. And I think we are maybe leaving behind the population. Because right now, there's a stigma against the methadone patient. Methadone patients are less likely to be in treatment. And as the young lady said before, it's very hard to get somebody who's on Suboxone into long-term treatment, recovery housing, things like that. It's almost impossible to do this for someone who's on methadone. So let's not perpetuate a stigma, and let's, get over, let's remember our history, and let's do something for all populations of people who are suffering from this epidemic of addiction. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad that you said that, because so this is another piece of my background and why I probably why I ended up starting to do what I do. I have an aunt who has been a long, long life proponent of civil rights. And 
I have been raised with that thought that all people are created equal. And I've said the same thing very often, is that if we, from the beginning, cared about our inner city neighborhoods and improving them, this would never be a huge problem. But it's that way across the board. There are so many issues that could be fought so much easier if we started long ago in those inner city neighborhoods. So thank you very much for your comment. This is uh, to us, to uh, Jessica, your comment with your, your information you gave. Yes. I would like to say that I'm a independent chemical dependency counselor, clinical supervisor, and I get calls regularly. Uh, they found that I am a provider, and they want to know where, did, where can they get med can I give them medicine mm -hmm. or anything so when they go to withdraw from the op opioids, it won't be so bad. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the nursing mm -hmm. or the others, it's the chemical dependency counselors also. Okay. Thank you. Two more I have here and here. First of all, I want to thank Melissa for allowing me to join this group, although it was full, because I wanted to come to this meeting because my hero and my teacher, Dr. Paran, is here. <laughs> Sir, I'd like to ask you a question, anybody else or you. Recently, you probably know, in last two months, American Society of Addiction Medicine has changed the definition of addiction medicine. Now, the old one was a very high-powered, high and high-powered English language. Now it is too simplistic. Do you have any comment why they change it or what is the uh, why, why about the addiction medicine definition, sir? Uh, sure. Um, I I think that um, I think that definitions of addictive disease now in the brave new world of the DSM-5, and we should probably have a brief moment of reverent silence <laughs> for the DSM-5. I was trained with the DSM-3, and I'm an internist. Then the DSM-3R was tough to wrap my brain around. DSM-4, I totally gave up on, and DSM-5 is like, oh my god. But, but. All of these are, are efforts to define what the disease of addiction is and to try to use terminology which is less stigmatizing. So in the 1970s, we called it alcoholism and drug addiction. In the 1980s, we called it chemical dependency. And now we call it substance use disorder, moderate or severe. Um, but the whatever we call it, the shorter the definition, the better as far as I'm concerned. And the more that the definition is written into real people's language, the easier it'll be for families and people to figure out whether they have it or not. So what I really like is a person with, a, with one of these substance use disorder, moderate or severe, I like to call it the high risk brain, um, but uh, people with, with this issue um, have an intermittent, inconsistent, unpredictable, but repeated loss of control over the use of a euphoria-producing drug that results in adverse problems in their life, and they crave for it when it's not there. And that's one compound sentence, which is even shorter than the, the new American <laughs> Society of Addiction Medicine definition. But I think the shorter the definition, the better, as long as it stresses loss of control, <coughs> adverse consequences, repeated over life involving euphoria producing drugs, which is opioids, sedative hypnotics, which is beer, wine, liquor, and benzodiazepines, stimulants, which is methamphetamine, crack cocaine, Ritalin, Adderall, and the rest of them, and then cannabinoids, which is called marijuana, medical marijuana, which is called marijuana, <laughs> um, and, and synthetic cannabinoids. The more that we think as a society about substance use disorders across all those drug groups, rather than we think about an alcohol problem or an opiate problem or an amphetamine problem or a marijuana problem, the more we think about them across those drug groups, the less like we are, likely we are to inadvertently precipitate relapses in people because we think all they had was an alcohol problem. 
and then we put them on a long-term controlled drug, we wind up precipitating a relapse. So I'm, I'm in favor of the shorter ones that stress the commonality of euphoria-producing drugs, loss of control, adverse consequences, repetition, and craving for the substance when it's gone, which is why treatment's necessary, because treatment addresses the cravings. Detox, you know, gets people off using, but treatment addresses the cravings. Okay. Yeah. Is, is this on? Or? Yeah, okay. just talk. I just have a question for naloxone in the community or for Narcan. How, what is the process for accessing that to then to be able to have it? You'll find out more about that in our next panel. Yeah, I think <laughs> I, I think it's probably it's probably best to defer that to that Joan was perfect. And, and the people from Joan Papp is speaking in the next Dawn. panel. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I want to say thank you to all of you. I appreciate your coming.